Hello, and welcome once again to The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And we have a very special bonus episode today, for we are joined today by Loretta Todd. Loretta Todd is a writer, director, and producer. Her credits include award-winning documentaries such as Forgotten Warriors, The People Go On, and Hands of History. She has also created, produced, and directed Tansen Nehiwetan, a Cree children's series on APTN. And she created MyCree, a Cree language learning app, which has had over 20,000 downloads. And she created Fierce Girls, a web series and transmedia project for Indigenous girls about Indigenous girl superheroes. And she is the director of the feature film adaptation of Eden Robinson's novel, Monkey Beach, which is premiering at the Vancouver International Film Festival right now. Thank you for joining us and congratulations. Thank you for this wonderful invitation to speak to your beautiful radio voices (laughs) and for all the good work you do about bringing great books to the world. Thank you so much for making time for us, especially in this busy week. It must be very intense. Well, making a film is very intense. This is just um, a lot of work, kind of many, many competing things on my time. But um, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's very busy week. I hope you enjoy as much of it as you can. Yeah. I'm curious about how and when you first encountered Monkey Beach and, and you know, did you did you fall in love with it immediately? Were you immediately thinking this would make a great film someday? What what was your story of your first encounter with it? Well, I think I think indigenous people I mean the book came out in two thousand and you know, I've been making films, you know, into through the nineties and so I'm always conscious of all the Indigenous writers and filmmakers and artists that are in our community. That community is growing um, in terms of its sort of public reach, but there's always been a strong um, personal uh, Indigenous community that you know we know of. We kind of move in with respect to artists and storytellers and so on. So I knew of Eden, you know, and she had published a book before, and I knew of this sort of. Um, genius that she seemed to to hold and and, and certainly was um this kind of charismatic person that is so at the same time very humble and uh, just really really dedicated to 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 writing and storytelling so i knew about her and then monkey beach came out of course and i saw it and it was one of those things oh i gotta get to reading it and i need to read it but gee i'm so busy um, one day I'll read it, and then I went to a event here in Vancouver, a media event, and this producer came up to me and she said, "Gee, Loretta, you should option Eden's book." And I said, "Why?" Because she said, "Your filmmaking is like her writing." Hmm. And so that was very intriguing, and I'm thinking, "Well, what does she mean?" Because my filmmaking hasn't always been, you know, necessarily um, at the forefront, you know, it hasn't necessarily been getting all the big accolades or rewards. And in fact, if anything, when I first started making my films, it was, I was always kind of go, Oh, that's not the way you make a documentary or that's not the way you make an experimental (laughs) film. It was always just very much my own vision, my own way of telling a story. And so I guess I thought, well, gee, this person must be like that too. She must be very individualistic, um, very much her own self, tells stories in a way that, you know, it's, it's, it's a continuum of, you know, a long line of storytellers and yet still somebody who's uniquely herself. So uh, that was sort of what struck me the first time. Um, but also, you know, I'd heard, I'd read reviews and had read this idea that there was all this kind of a movement through time and how sometimes that wasn't always easy for some readers that there was this these transitions that would happen within within a page that would move through time um so her ways of telling story is often what you might call elliptical so those were things that were sort of like intriguing and made me wonder and you know I I need to go out and see this book and find this book and read this book so I got the book and then I opened it and Surprisingly, she also had acknowledged me in the in her book. She had me in her acknowledgments. She had seen my one of my films, Forgotten Warriors, which was about uh, Native war veterans, and she had used that for some research for her book. But she also was, I guess, just kind of acknowledging me in terms of the work that I had done. So it seemed like, oh, this is really fitting that these series of events would lead me to picking up this book, see my name there, and then 
more importantly, I actually read the book. And when I read the book, it was really obvious that this was a book that really needed to be on screen. And maybe because it was such a challenging book, um, it needed even more to be on screen and even more my challenge. You know, anything when people say, oh, you can't do that or you shouldn't do that or that's not that's too hard or that can never be done. That's just more impetus for me to do that (laughs) thing, you know. So there was that. But there was also the fact that I was so moved, um, so deeply moved by the love that Eden showed for her characters. There was so much love she had um, for Lisa Marie and her family. There was so much devotion, really, to not so much their happiness, but their resilience. And there was a, and there was a kind of a strange combination of feelings. There was a feeling of nostalgia, of you know, of sentimentality it's it's interesting i remember when i studied at film school and our amazing semiotic film theory things and we watched it's a wonderful life and i remember my professor saying oh you know she was crying and i said yeah but you're like a freudian marxist sort of like semiotic professor why are you crying at this incredibly you know sentimental you know hollywood film and she says i can be sentimental too you know so in so it was interesting so in a way eden's book kind of gave me license if you like a permission to lend a lot of those feelings that you feel you kind of you know keep in because you think oh no you got to be the tough strong indigenous filmmaker or you got to kind of hide your emotions and hide yourself and yet here was Eden just letting it all be there you know um that those that sentimentality was okay that nostalgia was okay that love was okay that this sort of relationship to family was you know so central and 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 so critical even as that family is you know so um affected by grief by tragedy um and all the kinds of you know traps and and, and and meshings and and swords and and attacks that you know colonialism has has done on our lives and and, and our territories and our, and our families so those were all things that just really struck me and um then there was also that that true elliptical nature of the storytelling that we weren't just you know going to follow this obvious um, path from here to there that, you know, we were really challenged to, you know, f- go on this journey. And in the process of going on this journey, um, you know, challenged to, to to make our own sense of this journey. So it wasn't like, oh, here is an Indigenous story, now you know. It was like, here is a story of this family and this woman and all this stuff that's going on. What does it mean to you? And that's, I think, at the basis of Indigenous storytelling, um, Indigenous knowledge systems, is that, you know, you're not, this is not like, oh, you have to learn, you, you, that we're going to tell you what to know, what to think, and how to think it. It's like, I'm going to take you on this journey, and now it's your responsibility to make sense of that journey to your own life. And that's what I also found um, made it so um and, you, know, I don't, you know, it's a very Heisler story. It's a very much embedded in, in the Heisler territory and in Eden's, you know, um, life and where she's from and the people she knows, Not although it's a fictional story. Um, but here was this still, to me, that something that as another Indigenous person from another territory, I still felt, you know, there was that, that, that connection where, you know, taking that responsibility for, for this journey that I'm going on. So there was that, those things as well. But I think in the end, it also came down to obviously the beauty of the land that she, she so vividly, you know, portrays the fact that you feel like you're on the kit low, feel like you, you hear the sounds and you feel the, the, the wind and you, you know, you, the, you know, you, you, the water sort of swirls around you. All those things are just so vivid and yet in so many ways so simple in the way she, she writes them. It also made that so um, tangible and visceral for me, the way she portrayed land. Um, and then, of course, you know, the amazing Lisa Marie, um, who I changed to Lisa in, in, the, in the film, she was so much this 
this person who was on the precipice of embracing her medicine. And that could go either way. It could go to, you know, the void. It could go to to nothingness. Or it could go to, as I, you know, this, this embracing of her medicine and that, you know, realization of her, her, of her power. And I think to me as an Indigenous woman and, you know, still relatively young then because, you know, this has taken me so long, um, that feeling of, you know, what does that say to me? How am I that Indigenous woman, you know, on, the, on that sort of threshold of embracing my own medicine? So I thought, and, and you know, that was sort of all those things that really struck me and, and were so beautiful to me and, and made me so much wanted to make this into a film. It is such a beautiful novel. And when you said the love for the characters, the love for the family that suffuses that whole novel um, and what you feel I felt in the film as well. It's so powerful. Um, and the extent to which the family is the family that's present in the here and now, but it's also the family that's present in time. Those who are part of the spirit world, it's all our relations, right? It's a very rich web of, of you know, how far out the family extends. And that love suffuses all of those relations, I felt. You know, when you think about it, so many Indigenous stories are about that. And it gets, sometimes I get so frustrated when I hear reviews, oh, they're just struggling with their identity. Or, you know, they're, they, they're trying to have a decide between, you know, the, the, the modern or the traditional. Or, you know, there's all these kind of cliches that reviewers sort of fall back on all the time about, uh, you know, so much of our literature. And sure, you know, you know, there's there's that struggle. You know, you cannot not have that struggle in this, you know, colonial experience that we've all had to go through, you know, just as, you know, others have said, you know, just the fact that an Indigenous person is born is a political act. The fact that, you know, we, we that so, you know, there's, there's, there's no doubt about that. Um, but at the same time, you know, they often leave out the fact that you know, we really love family. We, we we want to serve our family and our nation and our territory and all our relations, as you say. And those relations are, you know, our ancestors and are yet to be born. So those are all things that I think that, um, you know, is, is at the core and the essence of, of Eden, but also I think, you know, Indigenous literature as well. Um, you know, and, and, you know, by extension, really, when you look at it, you, you know, perhaps all, you know, important literature, mm-hmm. uh, you know, mm-hmm. um, I know that, you know, I'm going to get theoretical here, but we could you know, appeal to some of your academic um, listeners. But, you know, I went to film school, like, you know, as I suggest, said, you know, the semiotic Freudian Marxist you know, <laughs> theorist who, you know, taught us film theory, who was, you know, a very brilliant woman. Um but who also Kasia Silverman, by the way, um, you know, and and sometimes you know they you know we you know this idea of the grand narrative of you know Western Western culture and yeah, the avant garde and you know so much of you know po- you know modernism postmodernism sort of work against that grand narrative, and it certainly is sort of weighted by patriarchy and you know Christianity and all those things that kind of you know permeate Western culture. Um, and yet, at the same time, there was part of me that was like, and that's their grand narrative, but what's our grand narrative, you know? I'm supposed to kind of deconstruct their grand narrative, but I don't want to deconstruct my grand narrative, you know? I want to be able to explore it and and express it and understand it and, and see what it makes sense. Or even if we do have a grand narrative, like, you know, what is that? You know, so those are the kinds of things when I look at Indigenous literature, um, you know, there, there's, you know, sometimes people, I think people forget that in a way that's at its core is, you know, how do we, how do we serve all our relations? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, you mentioned earlier too, the ellipt, I think you used the word elliptical structure of the narrative. And one of the things that Chris and I were struck by when we we're reading um, Eden Robinson's book is the very layered way in which time functions, you know, the, the, the boat journey actually structures the whole narrative, but then we go back into childhood, into teen years, you know, we're in and out of different time moments. And, and we said, wow, how is that going to translate onto the screen? Because like, that, that, that didn't sound easy. And the the choices that you made, you and the other screenwriters, were, were I thought, so interesting because there was a lot of displacement of moments, you know, like, so Lisa's encounter with her cousin Tab happens at the beginning of the 
uh, movie, but in the novel that happens at the end. You know, many things were, but the feeling, the 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 sense of time seemed to me so consistent. Um, I was so struck by that um, in watching the film. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. How do you manage those layered multiple temporalities? Was there a very different vision of time, or was that just part of the larger sort of restoring process? Well, to be honest, there actually was a draft of the script that I wrote at some point that literally was that, the boat, and the and the boat was the metaphor, and the boat was the journey, and the boat was the thing that took us through that. And, you know, there's a reality. You take it, you know, you've got to get financed, and you take it to, to telefilm, and they say, yeah, it's great, it's good, yeah, but, you know, it's not there yet. So you have to sort of see, well, what what are those places where I can still be true to that elliptical storytelling, that different sense of time, and yet still um, be able to kind of get through this, this, you know, kind of expectation of, you know, what an indigenous film is, or what a Canadian film is, or, you know, what an independent film is, all these kind of layers and expectations that are put on it. So it's, 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 you know, each step, Sometimes it was a great regret because it's like, well, gee, this one would make a beautiful film. Probably could have made 10 incredibly beautiful films of which, you know, there would be shared elements, but they all would be a little bit different because, you know, I'm I'm writing it in many different ways. Um, I think what um, the other writers, because I tried, I mean, I tried, even tried. And then she said, no, she said, she says she's fired herself because she just said, I can't, <laughs> I can't, you know, because she, she was the first one I asked to write the script. She's, I think it was just like going back or, you know, having to kind of, you know, re, re experience the book again. So, um, so I started writing it. And that's where the, I went on these kind of different tangents. And as I said, I thought, Every one of them was beautiful in their own way. But I finally had to f- say, okay, if I'm going to make this, and usually they'd end up being like 140 pages or 150 pages or even longer. And they would all say, it's your first feature, Loretta. You know, those are that, that many pages means a bigger budget. You know, it's not going to happen. So it's not, it's not even so much like you're compromising. It's more like, okay, how do I go into the zone? And in that zone, find that place that, is going to help manifest this in a way that is going to ensure that it can actually get on the screen. So I um, brought these two other writers on, Johnny Darrell and Andrew Duncan, and they actually have a totally unrelated background. They are actually animation directors um, working mostly in children's programming, but they've done other things as well, and they've kind of come out of a kind of a more punk tradition, if you like. And I I told them really what we need is structure, structure that still respects the integrity of Eden storytelling and of Indigenous storytelling, and yet gives us that sort of through line that is going to give that comfort level to those financiers who still are thinking in terms of the three-act plot point way of telling a story. Um, or if, you know, conversely, they want sort of like a wild and woolly, crazy experimental thing that really is more about their idea of what postmodernism is. So um, I wanted to kind of, you know, keep the integrity of of Eden storytelling. And so that's kind of what, you know, you're seeing on the film. Um, But yeah, I mean, I still wanted to move through, through time. And I think a lot of my filmmaking even in documentaries doesn't have a linear passage they never have and and you know maybe that's my failing I don't know I mean some people would say that I've never been able to say okay you know here's my thesis my documentaries and here I'm now going to prove it you know my thesis I've never kind of set off on that journey it's more like in you know the tradition of um, where I'm from, Cree and Métis, we our trickster character often many of the um, his stories, the Sakachak story starts off the Sakachak was walking. Mm-hmm. Well, you could go anywhere, you know, <laughs> and often you do. So in a way, that's my sense of that being brought and kind of merged with Eden's sense of that, and then the writer's sense of that, and together, you know, coming up with something that, that um, I hope, as you say, still, even in, in the restructuring of the book, still still feels like you're on that journey in that boat, you know, 
finding out more about about who Lisa is, her family, and and the, the tragedies and 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 the healing that she's she's going to experience. Is there any specific change that you made to the book that you're particularly pleased with how it came out on screen? If that makes if that question makes any sense. Um, I don't know. Well, there's actually something that I did write myself, which I then took out. I had this little thing about the um, Uligan Greece. I had a whole scene around Uligan Greece that is not in the book, but it was something that I thought might, you know, reflect the family. And in the end, I decided to take it out because I think I was making fun of Uligan Greece. And I decided that I shouldn't be making fun of Uligan Greece because for many um, Northwest Coast people, Uligan Greece is almost sacred. It's it's a it's the making of it and the using of it is a very important medicine. So I thought, you know, not gonna. I decided not to go there. So I actually I filmed it, but I took it out. Um, I mean, we did change a lot. Um, like you say, we don't start. I mean, someone recently wrote a review saying, you know, in the book, the phone call comes, and in the film, the phone call comes not until probably halfway through and I remember it was it was a risk I remember I was very fortunate to have Fred Fuchs who was you know once Francis Ford Coppola's producer on things like Godfather 2 and you know wonderful man who very give freely of his time to 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 support me on this production and um you know but at the same time you know he he's used to um very iconic um, stories told in you know in, in many ways very novelistic ways. Godfather two, all the Godfathers are very novelistic, if you like, you know, in their structure and the way they're telling, you know. So he's used to things not having to follow the usual conventions, and yet at the same time, you know, he would challenge me and say, "Gee, Loretta, you know, shouldn't you have that precipitating event? Shouldn't that precipitating event? Shouldn't you have them out on the ocean sooner?" and and, you know, the, the, the loss of Jimmy Sooner. And I don't know. I thought about that, and I tried. I did try it. I did try it in the editing, and I tried it even thinking about the scripts. But for some reason, it felt that it would be not copying Eden, but it would be um, I felt like I needed to bring people in. I needed people to go home first. I needed people to go on that journey with Lisa home first. And that was really important to me. And I think that's actually been a part of my oeuvre or, you know, whatever you want to call it in terms of my other films. When I think about it, many of my films are about that, you know, leaving home or going home. You, you know, even documentaries, Forgotten Warriors, you know, the veterans talk about leaving home, you know, having to um, go, some of them walking, you know, many, many miles to go enlist, you know, or when I made a film about, with the Kaina, I called, the people go on, the way I imagined structuring it, because it wasn't a, going to be an easy structure, it wasn't just a community battling a museum to get their objects returned, um, it was more about, I decided, about home, that here was were these beautiful things that had been made in home and they had left home and now they were coming home and they were in our people's sense these things were alive fortunately in that case none of the objects in that particular story were were ceremonial objects so um they had a different meaning in terms of the kind of people's relationship to them but in any case home has always been really central and maybe you know maybe that's me too because you know I ran away from home when I was 13 I come from a home that was full of love but also full of stress and and upheaval and you know poverty and so um you know home maybe home is that elusive thing that you know I've always been you know searching for so it's very, it's a personal thing, but it's also so faithful to the way in which the novel proceeds because, you know, you're just talking about it, it's important for Lisa to be coming home at the beginning of the film. And while we don't get that scene at the beginning of the novel, we do get that kind of map scene, you know, that beautiful, um, a few pages in, you know, find a map of British Columbia, point to the middle of the coast beneath Alaska, find the Queen Charlotte Islands, drag your finger across the map. Like we get situated home in the opening pages. So you've, you've restored it or translated it or made it new um, in a way that is different yet completely, I felt completely consistent with the novel. I was so struck by that. Oh yeah. I mean, that was something I thought a lot about 
those words. And I actually, at some point, actually, those words were in different drafts. And, and you know, it, some of it became budgetary. It's like, this is a, you know, animated motion graphic scene. And that's going to, you know, as much as I'm a filmmaker, I also have to produce because in order to be able to survive as an independent Indigenous filmmaker all these years, and also as that outsider person, I, I have to basically, you know, produce my all my own work. I find my own resources and I produce all my own work. So I've always been having to think about, well, what's that going to cost, you know? <laughs> and so that was, that was, you know, and what, what, what's critical here? Um, at one point I, I imagined that whole scene coming home, you know, as you describe and Lyle Wilson, who's from Kitimat, who's an amazing high school artist who I admire so much. He had, he, and I approached him and I said, gee, I would really love to use your artwork in here that would help um, bring us home. And um, those, that artwork would be layered over the land as that descriptions, you know, occurs. Um, and he was, you know, freely giving of his artwork. He said, yes, you can have it for free, you know. Um, but the act of taking that and animating it and at the same time needing my spirit creature, needing this, needing that, it was like, uh, you know, um, maybe a different time, maybe a different, you know, business environment, you know, in terms of finding those resources, I might have been able to achieve that, but I had to say goodbye to it. And it, it kind of breaks my heart. But at the same time, you know, so then I had to find something that would still be haunting and still make you feel some of that journey. And that's the, 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 the way she comes home now. Those words in that opening are dr directly from the book and some of the other stuff I sort of layered over it myself. Yeah. And that sense of homecoming, you know, it's it's there at the beginning, but of course it's there at the end too, in this extraordinary uh, visionary sequence. And again, you know, I remember thinking like, wow, how is she going to do that in a film? <laughs> you know, because that part of the book is so, so vivid, so real, so disorienting, so strange, so frightening, so beautiful, so moving. It, it's extraordinary. And it would have been possible to to translate that into something that was animation rich, but instead, um, I don't want to spoil it uh, for our, our listeners. But you use other means, and I'm thinking of the mask um, that Lisa wears and the physical environment that she inhabits um, in that landscape and on that land to create something that creates a feeling that's so harmonious. I felt with the novel while while literally being very different. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's funny, you know, people, um, you you wonder sometimes where your imagination takes you and where, you know, what sparks, like, what comes out of your imagination sometimes. It's like, wait, where did that come from, you know? And yes, it would have, again, you know, budget, you know, um, and But different... it works so beautifully. I mean, as it is, it works so beautifully. I was so moved by it. Oh, that's, that's nice. Yeah. It's funny because we filmed that, a lot of that. We had to actually, they were filmed in two different locations. One was in Kitimat itself, uh, actually three different locations, Monkey Beach itself in a forest near Kitimat, the village. And then also, and while well, giving away too much of the magic, another place altogether where I could bring some of that magic you're talking about in, into play. But it's interesting because um, one of the things that happens in many indigenous rituals or relationships to 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 those who have gone beyond us, gone before us, or gone into the other place. Um, we often uh, do what's called burnings, and we, you know, we burn food to send to them and, and to let them know that we're thinking of them and that, you know, they're not alone, if you like. You know, it's a way of kind of communicating. And and um, part of what you're seeing there in the space is what it looks like one thing, and it's certainly meant to look like one thing, but it's also in some other ways referencing that um, what happens as a result of that burning? Well, uh, you know, ashes. So, um, so that was kind of a, an effort there. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think we had this little park to work in, and I saw this um, forest that 
you know, so much of the forest is gone now, you know, I mean, that's the reality. And, and in that particular park, there was still a lot of second growth forest. And I saw, we were driving around looking at locations and I saw this spot where I could just see all this blue light coming through. And it just seemed like that's the perfect. And we had like, you know, someone's in a in a van driving, holding the camera. You know, it's all lit. The incredible cinematographer and his his team bringing us that beautiful light and then that beautiful lighting. Um, it's it's influenced by Eden's imagination and that place and those stories. But at the same time, it's coming out of my strange imagination, which in some funny ways is connected to you know some of the films I've seen out of Japan. So. You know, who knows? Hmm. Yeah, I, actually, it's funny. I was thinking about no theater, uh, watching that scene. So I wonder if it's that's reflecting that, that vision. I, I think a little bit, you know, I think a little bit. You know, I think I used to watch Japanese films a lot when I first started out as a filmmaker and going to film school. Um, you know, we got this, you know, had to watch all the usual film school films. But, um, and you know, every one of them, you know, was important to my journey as a filmmaker, you know, wondering how they made choices they did and what stories they were telling. But at the same time, I, I was always looking for how do other people in other lands who aren't Western, you know, don't come from a Western tradition of storytelling, how do they use the camera? Where do they position it? How do they move it through space? How, you know, how do characters, um, you know, occupy space? Um, how do they move through space? So I was always very conscious of watching Japanese film, films from China. I was always really uh, moved by films um, when I when I got to see them, and I didn't get to see too many from different nations in Africa. And, you know, the magical realism that used to come out a lot of South America that you don't see so much now. But um, so all of those were kind of, um, I guess, my teachers in a way. You mentioned a bit of this, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about working with the community in filming it. And I'm also curious whether the community have seen the film yet or if or if they have to wait until after the official premiere before they get a chance to, to watch it. Well, you know, the original plan was to show it in Kinemat before it was shown anywhere else. That's what I what I said I would do, and I and that's what I was going to do. But with COVID, um, I did go to the nation, and I said, you know, I would really like, you know, to to live up to that and show the film in, in Kinemat first before it's shown anywhere else. Um, but they said that because of COVID, they weren't having any. Um, meetings, any gatherings in their large gathering place, which in, in their case, it's like a large rec center. They weren't doing that because they, you know, and they actually in many, in many First Nations across Canada and in, and, and in the States as well, they basically, you know, you're not allowed in unless you live there, you know. And so um, many of the communities are still in that um, mode. And so they said that they didn't feel safe, um, you know, whether I was there or other people were there or not. It's just this idea of having people in a, in a gathering, you know, indoors. And then I said, well, what about an outdoor screening? You know, could we try to kind of improvise a drive-in? And even though that was kind of intriguing uh, or it was, the weather hasn't been that great up there. And this this year was when we were filming, but this year it hasn't been. It's been quite cold and it's been a lot of rain. So they didn't think that was going to work um, easily. So then, fortunately, Biff, you know, um, it, it actually did screen at TIFF as well, not in the regular festival because I wasn't able to get it finished in time to submit to the regular festival, but I was able to get it finished in time to submit to what they call industry select. So I was included in the industry selects, which was only available to to industry and media and so on. But in any case, um, when Fifth came, you know, reached out and said they wanted to premiere it at at you know opening the festival, which is amazing in itself. They also said that because of COVID, they were changing the 
way the Vancouver Film Festival was structured. So rather than just being a Vancouver-centric event, they had reached out to independent theaters throughout BC and had got a number of them on board to um, participate, one, in the premiere of, of Monkey Beach, but also, you know, in the screening of a few other films as well um, that, from the festival, so that it was no longer, you know, so that the festival then became available to to you know many many towns in bc and one of the critical towns because they asked me where do you think this film should be shown and i said well it has to be shown in terrace because terrace is the next closest town to kitimat where there's a theater and in fact the people at that theater had been reaching out um not directly to me but you know been getting a lot of messages that gee they want to show the film they want to show the film so when viff said gee that's Let's try to find a way to film, take this outside of the uh, Vancouver. And, you know, these are some of the towns we're talking to right now. I, you know, I said Terrace. And sure enough, the theater in Terrace, the Tilikum, um theaters, the people just totally embraced it. And they've done an amazing job. I mean, you know, we talked about the best way to doing this, but they've gone above and beyond. You know, they themselves did all this. They they approached, you know, chief and council, invited them. They approached the matriarchs and the hereditary chiefs, and they're putting on a separate screening just for matriarchs and hereditary chiefs because many of the elders are nervous about, you know, going into a theater. So they're going to just have a screening for them and they're, they'll be COVID safe. And then during the screening, we've been working together trying to get a like a good list. And it's not always been easy of all the cast and crew who were from Kinemat Village, Kinemat Town and, and Terrace and Prince Rupert who worked on the film. So that on the opening, um, we've got a good number of those people who will be also able to see the screening. And there's going to be two two theaters um because they own two theaters so um so they'll, they'll be there plus the invite the people who've been invited um dignitaries and eden and her mother uh, and then i've also asked that if we don't get everybody in that first night then here's a list of you know people who appeared as extras and you know if i'll pay for their tickets um just so that they can anyone that this would be a guest list and they can go free to to see the film other dates because terrace is going to show the fe the film beyond the festival so they'll show it through the festival and then they'll show it just beyond the festival as well it's apparently really big demand up there so oh that's fantastic oh absolutely yeah um yeah the lo the way the project rooted locally like that seems to me so so beautiful and so important and also the way in which even though it must have been uh, logistically and financially challenging you, the, the fact that you were able to film some parts of it on Monkey Beach itself. I was really struck by that. Was that important to you to, to film in the physical location itself, at least some scenes? So in terms of being able to film at the actual Monkey Beach, it's about a two and a half, three hour boat ride. And it's a very important place in, you know, the Heisla history and Heisla culture. And it's a place that people have gathered, you know, for, for, for many, 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 many years. And it's in the book, you know, they talk about the Baguas who lived there up the mountain. And in the monkey is like the idiom for the Baguas or Sasquatch. So, those stories are in the book about, you know, what happens at Monkey Beach and the Bugwas. So those are all like it's a it definitely is a place that has its own power, you know. And many years ago when I was, you know, developing the project and I went up with Eden and her dad and her cousin in the, her cousin's fishing boat and we went up to Monkey Beach. And all the way up there, her dad, the late John Robinson, told us stories about that rock and, you know, that place. And some of them were stories that happened, you know, many, many years ago, and some that happened in his lifetime. And, yeah, everyone was as vivid and um, alive. So when we got to Monkey Beach, we had fun, and Eden and I were, like, big, tough Indigenous woman. And here we are in this little zodiac trying to paddle to shore, and we're going around and around in circles. So, of course, her dad was getting a big laugh out of that. Um, we finally made it to the shore and um, hung out there and had fun. And I remember he, he scr had scratched into the sand. There's not much sand there, but he had scratched into the sand 
uh, these big three um, scratches to say, oh, look, at the guas has been here just to <laughs> have some fun with us. But but yeah, it, it was a magical place and it was always my dream. You know, maybe if I was Francis Ford Coppola, or <laughs> I might have been able to manage that, but um, to film there. But we did look a little bit into it. And I said, well, why can't we get like one of those um, work ca- worker camps um, on a barge and just bring everybody up there and film? Um, we looked into the cost of that. It was quite high. And there was one barge in the area that could accommodate that, but it was owned by a corporation and they were not letting it out. And then there's these um, fishing camps, these sports fishermen um, I, I don't know if it, it's happening much anymore now because of what's, you know, there's a lot more industrial development going on in that area. But in the past, um, you know, a lot of fishermen, sports fishermen from like um, Italy and Germany and, you know, come out and fly into into Terrace and then um, they go into, they get on these fishing um, boats, they put all to these sort of luxury boats together and they they kind of tether them all. And then they all kind of are out there for a while, you know, what they call sport fishing. And I, I looked into that as well, thinking, well, maybe we could use one of those. But they were all busy with, with these sports fishermen. So the logistics of bringing a crew up to to live there on these on the barge or on these boats just just was impossible. It's just, you know, it wasn't going to happen. If, and if it did happen, it would have to be at a, you know, at a budget level that just wasn't feasible. Um, so that kind of broke my heart, but, but it still was really critical that we still film, you know, um, important parts at Monkey Beach. And, um, so I did manage to be able to do that. I loved your description of that visit to um, Monkey Beach with Eden Robinson and her father. You dedicated the film to his memory, didn't you? Yeah, he was a wonderful man. Um, he was an amazing storyteller. You know, I would go up there and sit down with um, her family, like her brother and, and her sister, Carla Robinson, was really important to the making of the Monkey Beach as well. She worked um, with us up in, up in, in Kitimat. But, but before, when I would go up there, you know, there used to be a little cafe there uh, right on the water next to the house that we filmed the, the family house in. That, that place right next door is now uh, more like a little gallery and, and a little store. But before it was a restaurant. And um, we'd go in there and sit for hours and hours and listen to their stories. And every one of them is, you know, if you think Eden's amazing, you know, can you imagine, <laughs> you know, these are all people who are, you know, her her cousins, but they're older than her, you know. And so they have these tremendous stories. And her father, you know, he had Parkinson's, so it became harder and harder and more frustrating for him. But um, I always enjoyed being in his company and um, feeling welcome in his company. Her mother as well, Winnie, who's still with us. She's a you know interesting woman and you know who has her own own sense of humor and 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 sense of of the absurd, if you like. Um, but the um, it was always a great time um, to visit with him and. Um, Eden sort of broke my heart because last year at the Seashell Writers Festival, I went to listen to her as she, you know, um, presented about Trickster. And, um, of course, in the audience, because there's so many devoted Monkey Beach fans, Monkey Beach came up as well. And people in the audience said, gee, isn't Monkey Beach also being made into a feature film? And she said, oh, yeah, it is. And by the way, here's Loretta Todd. She's in the audience. And she's, you know... And she told me that in the audience that her dad was my number one fan. And then I started crying and then she started crying. And she said, I, she said I should stop crying so she can stop crying. So we both stopped crying. But, um, yeah, I would write, send her drafts of the script and he would read them. And uh, and be uh, bemused sometimes by you know how off we were things, by, <laughs> with things. But at the same time, you know he he was always very patient. So yeah, he was. Uh, I don't know. He was just sort of like he was life of the party, but at, at a different kind of level. It wasn't sort of like just frivolous. You know, look at me. It was a. Uh, it was a. Uh, just that old timers. You know those old those old timers that had been around old timers. You always can tell when people 
grew up with the old timers, like the old timers who predated going, having to go to residential school. And um, they, they just have a different sense of being, you know. Mm-hmm. No, it's, it's lovely having that dedication to him because it's a kind of a another layer to the um, sort of loving account of that family that you have through the whole film. So it, it's a, it fits in beautifully. And that... I think is going to be a lovely note for us to end on because we've taken quite a lot of your time and it's a very busy week for you, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which we appreciate very much. That has been a lovely and interesting and fascinating conversation. So thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you. And thank you for all your wonderful questions and your interest and, you know, the fact that you bring so much knowledge and respect for for Eden and her work and, and, you know, um, you know, your very thoughtful and insightful um, look at the film. It's been a bit of a struggle because I sometimes I've had a couple of bad reviews. I wouldn't say bad reviews, indifferent reviews. And although they still say they're great films and you should see them, it's sort of like that, that whole meandering, that elliptical thing. I don't know. It's, it's, so, so, so it's encouraging to see that people actually get it and love it and understand it and have made it their own. And so, uh, you know, I thank you very much for that. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you. Show notes with links for anything we've mentioned in this episode are at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 35B. And The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time. See you again at The Spouter Inn.